Hello, everyone, and welcome at the security morning of the Embedded Linux Conference. So why am I talking about security subjects today? Because it's fun, but also because I want to give you stories. Why I want to give you stories? Think a little bit. When was the last time when you were talking to some other developers? Please submit smaller patches that we can review them. Please do not leave that root access to this device in the production image. Please do not touch that hot oven. We all do that. And what happens after that? Quite often, they actually do it. So I frequently use stories showing what happens if you do a bad thing and what that kind of a disaster can happen. And in this case, it frequently helps. So I'm going to give the same thing to you. And then who am I to be talking about that? This is what happens when people ask me to choose a label. So I'm a security person consulting as a security expert for multiple projects. Um, I do trainings, but I'm also a developer by education. So I'm mixing security world and the development world. And my picks for today, absolutely personal choice, Brick Trains, HTTP2, Signing Keys Leak, Linux Kernel, and the Exe. Well, couldn't, couldn't stop myself from that last one. But let's start from some fun Brick Trains. Just wondering how many people have heard about this one before. So the whole story, it actually happened in 2022 but the um, presentation of the security researchers was done in 2023. Uh, from what I know, they still haven't published a paper that they were promising, but well, I'm do doing with the resources I have. So imagine, a regional train operator is buying trains with complete maintenance manuals. The complete maintenance manuals that are expected to give you information enough to do the maintenance without the manufacturer. Apparently they are a few hundred pages long, or maybe more. And then they sign a maintenance contract with someone else. That's exactly what they were expected to be able to do. So what could go wrong? And the reminder, train market is something that is heavily regulated especially for safety concerns. So what could go wrong? The workshop does the maintenance and they try to start the train and it doesn't start. First train, second train, third train, they are just not starting. So someone from the workshop became a little bit suspicious about what was happening, it, and they got in touch with a reverse engineering group called Dragon Sector. And what happened after is that the story hit local and international news. They have presented at the Chaos Congress, but I'm going to do a short overview of what happened. And it's Linux related because apparently those trains have Linux boxes on them. So what they have found, they have found locks. They have found that the train is not going to start after a long stop. This is a little bit technical. Why a long stop is important in a train? Because the local trains are running all the time. And the only moment they are not running, they are at maintenance. That's why it makes sense. The trains were breaking after GPS position map. And there, were a, there was a list of conditions for those GPS matches. The researchers have plotted it on the map. 
And what they have found that, surprise, surprise, those positions match with workshops of the competitors of the manufacturer. Surprise, surprise. There was also a lock on a date. Some trades were breaking on a specific date. And not breaking, you need to do maintenance, but breaking like there is some component of the train that is broken. And they have also found out cheat codes. There's some codes on the driving wheel of the train. I don't know how do we call that. And you, you use that code and it unblocks the train. So, of course, the, the manufacturer is saying it's not them. Uh, some people think, think otherwise, and there is an investigation in progress, at least for the um, competition laws. But apart from the patents themselves, there is something about the development of the firmware for those trains that I could see from, uh, from the report of the researchers. First, they have downloaded firmware from multiple trains. And it turns out that basically every train has a different version of firmware. So um, there were pet device changes. Did they have version control? Did they have tests to actually test the firmware that are flashing on those trains? I don't know. And also part of the firmware had build paths in the metadata. And how they look like is not CI. They look like paths on someone's machine. So we can have some doubts about the quality of the process of the development, right? And then trains are certified. So the question is why the certification didn't spot it. I don't have access to certification documents, so I, I'm not able to say what they are checking. But that's, that's an interesting part. And the last one, the ethics of the people who have put those conditions in the code. How it was explained to them to add that feature? And why did they decide to put them in, especially for the GPS conditions, because that is pretty obvious what is it going to do. So as I, say, as I said, investigation is in progress. From what I know, the manufacturer of the trains wanted to sue the reverse engineering group, and apparently they didn't. Well, but the investigation is still in progress. And then, HTTP2. Everyone knows the protocol. In 2023, there was an important coordinated disclosure among multiple projects for so-called HTTP2 rapid reset issue, um, also called CV 2023-44487. This was actually exploited in the wild. And the issue is a little bit complex from the technical point of view, but I will try to explain rapidly. In HTTP 1, you are creating a connection to a server, you are sending one command, and the connection is closing down. That's not very efficient, so HTTP2 has a possibility to have multiplexing of multiple streams. And you have messages to, to allow to, um, to open and close those, those parallel connections. And it turns out that there was a common issue in an implementation of that feature, it meant that, uh, that uh, when a client was sending a reset frame that was closing the connection. It wasn't counted into the um, rate limiting 
value. So, and creation of those, of those streams, especially with HTTPS, um, it's requiring resources from the servers. Servers had way more work to do. That was amplification of work resulting in a denial of service. Most of the HTTP servers available were affected by this, by this issue. Um, all the links in this presentation are clickable, so you will be able to read more later on. So, which patterns do I see? We do have a weakness in the protocol itself. Not the first one and not the last one, because in 2024 we had uh, yet another, not in this, this exact um, same place, but there was another one. But what is in interesting that the web servers written for embedded with careful resource allocations, they were way less affected than the other ones. Because if you do the batch processing, if you limit the number of messages in flight per client, you are not allowing this to happen. So we have an example of flight HTTPD that the team says that they didn't have that issue. And also for servers that did have the problem, um, you can see how it is useful to add rate limiting like in the patch that was done in ng-http2. So embedded could be less vulnerable to certain attacks than the, than the general software written without constraints. Now we are going to move to a different, different type of a story, also a technical and quite fitting for all embedded applications because of Secure Boot. So Blipping Computer reported that MSI was a target for a ransomware attack. The attackers took data from the network uh, MSI didn't pay the ransom, and the attackers started publishing things that they have found in the data. They publish it, uh, published it um, in the darknet. Among the things that were in the released data were private keys for signing of MSI firmware. And why? Why it's important? Because all of the secure boot schema that we have right now, they depend on the security of keys. At some point, you need to put the hash of a key in some hardware one-time programmable of PGA memory. There are multiple levels, and one, one level depends on the other. If there is a breakage at one level, you have the whole secure boot that is compromised. Usually the hardware itself has possibility to, to do key revocation. So when you find out that one of the keys have been leaked, there is a possibility to, to have a hardware feature that is revoking this, uh, this key. The positive thing about the MSI situation is that apparently they had a separate key for each product model. So they didn't decide to have one key for all of their products. That's already, that's already something positive. But keys were leaked during a ransomware attack. What it means, ransomware happens in the main network of a company, usually. So either the machines with those private keys or the backup containing those, those private keys were in the main network. Not great at all. And the other thing, apparently MSI didn't have a revocation mechanism at all. 
So what it means that the attackers can use those keys until the end of the uh, end of life of the products affected. Not great at all. So revocation mechanisms for secure boot they are quite often complicated. So I can assume, I can understand that some people do not want to implement it because it's hard to do. But if you do not want to implement revocation, you can handle it differently. Two machines or more for redundancy reasons, not connected to the network or just hardware tokens for those keys. They do not have to stay plain especially if they are as important as those keys. No? A little bit more software. So I've, I've made a pick of uh, Linux kernel security issues for 2023. Absolutely personal choice. First one, uh, 2023-2163, which is a possibility for incorrect functioning of the BPF verifier that could be marking some programs that are not correct as correct. Serious issue because BPF allows basically to execute code in the kernel context with the privilege levels and so on and so on. Every issue in the BPF validator, it's a serious one. And this one, we have a link to the fix, showing also the details of, this, of the situation where uh, this issue could happen. And then the second one, 2023, uh, 5178. This, is, this one is in a driver. Use after free. And use after free could handle, could make execution, could do privilege escalations, also different things could happen. The discussion about the patch of, of this one is a little funny because it turns out that even seasoned kernel developers have doubts of how to submit patches to the stable, to have them included into stable. Well, okay, there were others. One thing I didn't tell you about those two is that those are two of the 11 that had the CVSS score, so the vulnerability severity of nine or more. Basically, it means as bad as it could be. But there were hundreds of other ones. Bugs in the kernel, they have heavy potential impact because, because if it's a bug in a driver, you send a malform, a device sends a malform message and well, there's a control of system memory. And in embedded space, we have configurations that vary from one system to another. So we have a different configurations of, of bugs that are available in there, so management of all this is a little bit complicated, at least. There are some good points about the way the kernel is handling security issues. First, the policy of not breaking the API. Because it's mostly safe to update the kernel version and then you get all of the security fixes with it. Occasional breakage, the breakages that happen because that wouldn't be the real world if they didn't, they are considered as bugs. As some projects are fighting with them more than others, and I, I can see which part of the audience is laughing in there, but they are taken into account seriously. And there is a real path to have those breakages fixed. And then CV assignment, still 2023. Around half of all the CVs in the Yocto project, the whole build, were Linux kernel CVs. 
very hard sometimes to do the correlation between the issue itself and the fix because they were assigned by dozens of different companies, everyone doing it in a different way. And there's always a conflict of interest between the project and the security researcher. The security researcher wants a high severity CV. Uh, the project wants otherwise quite often. And then who controls, the, who is writing the CV wins, basically. And this is what the Kerna team has done in 2024. Yes, too late, but they did. <laughs> okay, and now, uh, who haven't heard about the XZ issue? No, okay, there are some people who are not, not very sure what, ha what happened. Okay, so the XZ, the popular compression library in version 5.6.0 and 5.6.1 included the backdoor. That was, and that is specific about this case, included by a co-maintainer of the project. We can, at this point, we are pretty sure that it was actually included by that person. It wasn't an account that has been compromised and then someone did it for them. The OSS security has a big complete discussion with links to different analyses and a lot of information about how it was uh, progressing. Good things about the whole story is that it has been actually spotted before it landed in the long-term support versions. That's great. And on our embedded side, our various build system, leapsies and all architectures and all other things like that, they can be helpful. A fun fact is that the Yocto project hasn't updated the exit to 561 because it broke the build. It broke the build, Richard didn't understand what's happening, it looked strange, so he went to, to doing other things. But actually, it could have, it, it could have been spotted in the Octo project if someone had enough time to do the investigation why, why it is producing strange build errors. So it wasn't just luck that it was spotted by that one person. There are some other protection ways and how we could have spotted this one before. And what we can see in this issue, this, the sole maintainer with high workload, as usual, um, funding issue in the project. So absolutely classic. But then we also have the code of the exploit that has been obfuscated and hidden in binary data, so that was that was really, really, really well done. How many of you understand M4 scripts? Mm, kind of two? And that's the issue. Include a backdoor in M4 scripts. Nobody is going to review that. No way. No way people are going to review it correctly. So an attacker can consider doing an exploit in the most obscure programming language, maybe doing M4 with a little bit of said Perl and I don't know what else, to make it completely impossible to understand for someone. Lessons learned, um, use readable languages for build systems. Okay, the conclusion time. There are certain ideas we have learned, but we have stories behind those ideas. 
The protocols may have bugs, may have elements that are not clearly defined as HTTP2, but if you are implementing them, consider different situations that may happen. The protocol is not protecting you from everything. And attackers may actually send something that is not according to the protocol. And then what is your code going to do? For me, development security practices are actually security best practices. Mandatory code review is a security measure. Small, co small comments, it is a security measure. Having tests for your software, it is a security measure. Important to consider your dependencies or those projects maintained by the person in Nebraska, are you really sure you want to use them? And if you want to, can you make sure that they are actually well-funded and they are people maintaining them as they should be? And last but not least, security practices are there for a reason. Security people use risk analysis. So if there's a security practice that is making your life harder, ask the security person why. Because maybe working around the same risk has a different solution that can be implemented in your case, instead of a work around the, the security practice. I hope we will have Time for a question or two? We do. Do we have a microphone? Probably we do have. Yeah, we do have. Do we have a question? First question. Uh, yeah, we have a question. Use a, use a microphone because we are streaming. Do you know what the nature of the build failure was in the Yocto project? I have been, I've looked into that. We have looked at with Richard. And for me, it looked after the fact uh, that it was the, the symbols of the, of the backdoor that were just not compiling correctly. Um, I, ca I can send you the link for the, for the build failure because we still have it. Yeah, I mean, it would be fun to make sure that we catch it if that happens again. So you have to reconfigure. Uh, we can. Could you could you could you speak to the microphone? Or? Yeah, it's it's here. Yeah, yeah, with microphone for the streaming and the recording. Yeah, so Yocto reconfigures before running the configure, and I think um, usually most of projects run the configure that's provided by the you know project, and that can catch all sort of. Uh, Errors, or you know, it reruns the M4 scripts, and so that catches a lot of these things. So I have a different question. Uh, when you were talking about the bricked trains yeah. and the certification, and you put a question mark next to it, right? So, as somebody who's been through a lot of various certification processes. If you hire, you know, this agency, right, who is now, they are the ones that are signed up to uh, be able to give you that stamp. It's in their best interest to get you that stamp so they can keep taking your money. So I'm wondering what your additional thoughts are about the, that process and what we could do to improve that type of situation, because it's pretty clear from that from what you shared, that this should, this should have been caught by the certification process. Yeah, I would assume that there was no complete code review during that certification, because if there were, that should have been seen. But a certification with a code review is way, way more expensive than the certification with a checklist. So I don't know how it works for trains, I would assume there was no, there's no source code review in this case. 
A source code review as a, for a certification would probably catch. Um, but well, can we do uh, such certification for all types of critical software? Probably not. So uh, to answer your question, I think um, uh, the, there's a punishment, right, for the certifier, right? Uh, we don't have to impose one necessarily because now their reputation is severely damaged. Uh, so there may be a market effect on, on that company to dissuade them from being lax in their analysis. Do we have additional questions? Yeah. Maybe I miss it. I just want to know what the change are going to be done in 2024 regarding the CV in the kernel and their tracking. Okay, so, so what happened, what happened uh, in the Linux kernel in 2024? Uh, before, so in 2023, the whole 2023, uh, the Linux kernel had a policy to not assign CVs to issues. As security researchers who do security work on the kernel and everything else, they want the CV numbers because that is something that they put in their CVs. They were asking different CNA, so the numbering authorities that have a scope of we assign CVs to, um, to all issues by uh, our researchers, no matter which project it is, basically. As a result, it meant that it was the security researcher who was writing the CV description and not the developers who have fixed it. It meant that when I was analyzing the flow of, of the CVEs for the Linux kernel, sometimes it was hard to understand which CVE is which commit. Because there was, no, there was no link anywhere. Quite often it was written in such a way that it was hard to understand. And just you, you didn't know. The new policy is that is the Linux kernel assigning the CV numbers, and they only assign when the issue is fixed. So the situation is way, way more clear. I'm working with many projects, and when we have a CVE to assign, when the researcher wants a CVE, I ask them, either do we assign a CVE, and then we write the description. So you developers write the description, or you refuse, and then the researcher will go to someone else, and they will write the description. So what do you prefer? They always say, okay, we are going to write it. <laughs> and if your project is not a CNA, or is not in a foundation that is a CNA, just do the paperwork and became a CNA because then you control the security information about your project. Hope that was clear. Yes. Great. I think we still have time for one. And still regarding the CV, did it will help to know which version because now when the CV is open, it's always like the latest version of the kernel that's affected and it's hard to know if like 5.4 5 is or not and is, is, the, is the kernel will do a job to look at they the older version or not yet? Uh, they, they do have a workflow for that. It, it looks pretty good. Okay, if there are no more questions, we are going to finish the presentation for today. And uh, if you want to continue discussion, there are ways how to contact me. The presentation is online already with all the links that are clickable. I'm not using QR codes, imagine why, uh, but the links are there so you can use them. Thank you.